from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer. Kaylin Kyle is here. David Goss is here. Matt Doyle is not here. And the first name off the bench, as always, is Tom Bogart. He's pushing for a starting position. He's starting, as far as armchair analysts go, on MLSsoccer.com. Tom, I saw you replace Doyle this weekend through the mustache on it. What's up, man? <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been Doyle getting sick has been a pretty good week for me and, and, and my opportunities. So I can't I can't necessarily say I need to Doyle get get better soon, but take your time. Yeah, in the press, normally <laughs> players are like, "Yeah, look, we you know you don't want to mis- misfortune on people. Like, we hope he gets back. When he gets back, you know, it's his starting spot." Tom's like, "No, no, be as sick for as long as you need to be. You're out, and that's positive for me." Match day four wrap up coming your way right now. It was a crazy match week. Forty four goals. St. Louis, obviously, still doing all caps things in Major League Soccer. They're atop the supporters. Sorry, Supporter Shield City <laughs> is where we're at. That's maybe the biggest story, or it might be Tiago Amada and Atlanta. We'll jump into all of it. We have your mail and much, much more on this show, even if we don't have Doyle. So what's the best thing, Kaylin, you saw in match day four? Well, before I get to that, I have to apologize for my background noise. My four-year-old's at home sick with strep throat yet again. I didn't think you could get strep throat twice in one month, but here we are. We are living through it, so I apologize again if he comes in and makes a little bit of a cameo. For me, St. Louis, baby. Everything St. Louis, from the players to the fans, for the first expansion team going 4-0-0, creating history. I mean, I know we're going to break them down later on in the show, but you can't not love them at this moment. Let me ask you this, though. Um, by the way, both of my children have strep, too. So if in, you're in the New Jersey area and you have a tickle in your throat. It's a throat, pandemic in here in Jersey. Just, yes, please go get yourself tested. It's insane. And you said you like everything St. Louis, but do you like Provel cheese? Have no. you had Provel cheese? Do you know what Provel cheese is? It's not, I'm, not, I'm not a fan. I, I stick to what I know. I like my Parmesan. I like my cheddar, my sharp cheddar from uh, Ireland, and that's it. I this don't go with strep. Oh, sharp cheddar no, from Ireland. No mozzarella? Yeah. The, I, no, is, I like mozzarella. It's you got to have it on the right thing. I got to have. It I was going like to say you're in New Jersey now. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're going to change your mind on this. Oh, I'm going to check back from in. Beatles down the street. I only go to Tony. <laughs> you guys, I'm trying to stay away from cheese because my suits on Saturdays are not fitting the same since I moved from Miami to Jersey. Well, New Jersey <laughs> way. Yes, Let's go. You see, Tom. This is Tom's wedding suit. What he's wearing right now. <laughs> Is what you wear. Yeah, that's, it's, it's when you come down the aisle, you hear that little clink of yeah. the old of the '90s zipper and the swishing of the of the starter era sweatsuit. Yes, that's a that's a good one. Yes, I'm sorry, St. Louis uh, folks. We just had to speak the truth to you on Provel cheese. Your team might be good right now, but your cheese continues to be hot garbage. No what's good. Yeah, uh, what's the Kansas City cheese? I don't think we have a cheese. Oh, interesting. So you yeah. have a lot to talk about other places, but you yeah, we have a, we have a cut of meat. We have brisket. We have brisket. We don't. We don't try to elevate our cheeses. I Dave, didn't we know Kansas they don't. City invented cows. <laughs> By the way, where's this extra time going? <laughs> uh, well, we're going to David Goss's best thing he saw. In Lazy Mexico. River. That's where. Uh, I would say it was Provel cheese. That was the best thing I saw this weekend. Uh, I gotta go north always. When the crowd is like that in Montreal, that's where you want to go. They come back. Obviously, they get the red card from Philly, but the comeback the ridiculous nature of it, but the energy in the big O that place. It's not ideal. It's not perfect. But when that team is good and the fans come in, that place bounces. And so you always want to watch a game there. It went as Montreal and Philly as this thing could have gone. And it was pretty epic. They got their first ever win. A couple of the kids from the Academy played a pretty big hand in it as well. So front to back, I think this was maybe the most entertaining game of the weekend. Yeah, and drama. you know the poutine you... was pouring yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking now, of cheeses. The yeah, curves were rolling. <laughs> I'm on board with the poutine. I'm on board with the poutine. All right, Tom, give it to us. Yeah, for me, it was Hector Herrera scoring for Houston, his first MLS goal, and a long-winded celebration that was him jumping into Ben Olsen's arms, which I thought was pretty cool. And not to get too body language doctor on us here, but this club, from the front office to the coaching staff, have been publicly and privately challenging Hector Herrera to be better, to be more of a leader, to be more engaged, and, and again, lead this group. So I thought that that was a pretty cool moment that he scored and went right over to Olsen. So whatever they're, whatever they're challenging him, he, he's kind of picking it up. Uh, Tom, if you could choose one MLS manager to jump into his arms in a moment of glory, who would that manager be? 
Uh, it's got to be somebody tall, the big frame, so that so that they have a lot of room to carry you and, and make make you feel safe and and sound. Right, so this um, is an OSHA issue for you. Okay, I see. <laughs> I think Jim Curtin because he's always in for the celebrations. It would be funny to you know like Peter Vermees to catch somebody I, against his will, like he did with Willie Agata, and it's like a quick like okay, get get away from me. <laughs> but he's not going to drop you. That's a no, absolutely not. Gio Savarese not going to be happy other. about it. But he's but he's yeah. gonna but he'll. Catch I you. worry about Gio that he would move as you jump because he's celebrating on his own. Like, <laughs> he would, he would he jump with you. Energy on his celebrations. Yeah. Okay. Just had to ask you the question. I, I think Losada got yellow carded for celebrating too far outside of his box. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> on the uh, on the second goal that then got called back, then then got VAR, that then got VAR. Uh, he deserved it. It's been a tough start in Mon- Montreal. That was their first goal and win. So let's uh, let's wrap it up here and get into things with my best thing I saw on match day four. It's almost a list. We've established that two things does not count as a list. This is a pairing for uh, FC Cincinnati. So first of all, they don't start Lucho Costa because it's on the banks of Lake Michigan, and there were a number of extremely cold <laughs> games this weekend. And this one was absolutely frigid. I think it was feels like eight degrees and. Maybe the Saskatchewan girl with us can tell us whether that's a tolerable soccer temperature. I've never attempted to play in that temperature. What do you think? Yay think or nay? Like, what is that? Minus 11 for all of the people that don't use your metric system Celsius. here. So it is Forgot cold. Yeah. It is. We're taking this thing globally, okay? Not only our shows on the weekend, but this podcast. Um, yeah, it's cold. I'm not going to lie. That is, It's not Saskatchewan cold. I will say that I grew up in like minus 40, minus 50. That oh. is cold. Yeah, that's like you're literally running to and from your car, so you're like you're not freezing your face off. Yeah, I didn't know that existed, honestly. But anyway, Lucho Costa does not start, which was a you know a, a decision that I would probably have made as well if I was Pat Noonan, and also if I was Lucho. But he comes out in the 80th minute. They're down three one. He immediately uncorks the pass of the weekend to Sergio Santos, a, a diagonal ball that just I mean the way this thing floats and just kind of hangs in the air, almost like it reminded me of ultimate frisbee. When you see those guys, those guys, those girls just like uncork a 60 yard ultimate frisbee pass. I don't know what they call them. And it just kind of like floats down into the on running person's arms. It was ultimate frisbee esque. Tom, I'm guessing he played in college. <laughs> no, no, uh, just, my, no just, hold on. We, we, the Tom's best, the only uh, one that Acosta, found that hilarious. <laughs> I'm, if we be watching a Lucho Acosta assist and being like, you know what this reminds me of? Ultimate Frisbee. Like, exactly. exactly. We all have our own our own viewpoints, Tom. Let me have mine, okay? And Junior Moreno's viewpoint in this game, by the way, is that he was going to score literally everything. Junior Moreno has played more than 10,000 minutes in Major League Soccer. Up until the other night in Chicago, he had scored three goals. He scored three goals in this game. One was taken back for an offside. The other two counted. But just an incredible, like, statistical anomaly that will never happen ever again for Junior Moreno. Uh, just a pretty incredible note. Because he's a Venezuelan uh, international. Again. Yeah, I, just out of character, man. I don't know where that came from from him. All right. Let's dive into things and go deep on Atlanta United. Nick hit us up and said, I hope everyone enjoyed when Atlanta United was bad. We're back. And they're back leading extra time. So here we are. Tiago Almada is your early MVP. Fans of the pod despair. We're going to talk about this guy for as long as we need to. Four goals, four assists so far this season. Nobody's ever done that in their first four games of a season in Major League Soccer. So he's making history there. He only scores bangers. Somehow we didn't put his free kick in the best things we saw on match day four. But it is absolutely, I mean, it's just mind-bending. I know Nick Romano came out on Twitter and said, hey, look, goalkeepers save this if the wall is set up differently like that's all well and good nick and and if that had happened differently maybe we could talk about that but it didn't there was a big wall atlanta united tossed a couple more guys in the wall and tiago amada took two and a half steps and just absolutely wrapped his foot around this thing it looked like five yards outside and above the top right corner and absolutely upper 90 belter just an incredible goal a menace on the break the best player in Major League Soccer, period, right now, Dave. Period. You shouldn't have come to me first on that because I don't know that I agree with you. Perfect. But because uh, uh, I think we just talked about Lucho Acosta, who to me is the MVP favorite right now. It's his to lose wow. and everyone else Interesting. to chase. I like what That's Almada's fake. done. And when you look at Atlanta's start to the year, it doesn't happen without him. Tiago Almada carried them through the San Jose game. He's the reason. They blew Charlotte out in that first half, and he did it once again here. And uh, right now, Pineda has created a setup where they get themselves in transition moments. They get Almada 35 yards to run. 
And he, when he, what he's able to do at, at high speed is up, unreal in this league. He's able to find runners. He's able to beat defenders even at full speed and keep the ball under control. And then the opposing teams scatter because you're nervous. You're trying to recover. Everyone's trying to figure out who's going to step to Almada, and he's effortless. And if you decide we're not going to deal with transition moments, we're just going to foul them, then he can step up and do this. And that's the other part of the game that he brings is you don't really have a fix. So unless you're going to sit in deep and try and have us break you down for 90 minutes, you can't stop Tiago Almada. And that's a weapon very few Major League Soccer teams have ever had. So in other great news for Atlanta United and maybe bad news for the rest of the Eastern Conference, More bad news uh, Araujo scores. Uh, Caleb Wiley scores again, now has three goals, two assists in the season. Yakumakis scores, gets his first goal. He looks like an absolute like goal psychopath in the Joseph Martinez mold. Uh, it's like it's trending that way. They're tied for the league leading goals. They lead the league in possession. They have the second best XG mark in the league. The only possible issue here, Tom, and we're all thinking it, is how long they hold on to Tiago Almada. Ash hit us up, said, how much is Almada worth right now? And uh, Ricky hit us up and said, start the bidding at $40 million and keep pushing it higher. <laughs> Do you agree once with Dave, by the way, that Almada is not the MVP front runner? I'll start that quickly. Give me a short answer, yes or no. Very clearly the MVP front runner with eight goal contributions in 360 minutes. <laughs> I completely agree. And now, what do you think could happen with Thiago Almada? So Atlanta United are going to try to keep him for as long as they can, and that would to them is the winter. So they're going to try to not sell him in the summer, but I'm not sure if they're going to be able to. Like the the bidding, it's, it probably starts at thirty million. It, it has to be the league record fee, and then I'm not sure how much higher you go or what the market's going to look like. Again, all these things are contingent on how many teams are interested, what teams they are, where the bids are coming, and if two teams are going to kind of bid against each other. What is cool is that he's so clearly, like, in the global game, like a wonder kid. Like, it's not just, oh, this, this player from MLS is playing well. Like, there is no, there is no qualifiers to, to suggest about his performance and about his talent and the way he's seen around the world. Um, he's going to be playing for a big European club at some point in the near future. He's going to break Miguel Marone transfer record, the league outbound transfer record, which is $27 million, I believe, uh, to Newcastle. This is... It's only about if Atlanta are able to hold on to him through the summer into the winter because, rightly so, their attack orbits around Tiago Mata. That was a smart tactical decision. That's what they need to do. When you take him out of this team, they could have a lot of similar problems that they've had in the past. Like, he's a cheat code in transition. He's the anti Ezekiel Barco. He makes the right decision so frequently, which is, I think, what makes him so special. He has all the technical qualities and everything else, but his, his IQ and vision is something special. And that that's what separates a player from being a mid-table Premier League club to one of the biggest clubs in the world. Like this, he's awesome. And Atlanta have runners around him, which is not something that they have had in the past. That the attack is a cohesive unit rather than just a collection of talent that they hope is gonna, you know, fit well and score goals. So again, it, if Atlanta are able to hold on to him through the summer, they're going to be one of the best teams in the league. If not, they better have a replacement ready and somebody who can fit in immediately. That's so sick that the train is going in the background. Five stripes, like, style. So sick. Freight train. Atlanta United. Kaylin, uh, what do you think of Atlanta so far? Take a big picture. Big picture. I, I agree with everyone. I cannot see Almada staying there past the summer. And I think Atlanta United would be crazy to hold on to him. I mean, the, that's the one thing about Atlanta United is it's such a desirable club, not only because of the fans. I mean, it's a, it's a great place to live. But it's because young players can go there and they've seen it time and time again and get sold off by a lot of money. Excuse me, my four-year-old's, um, I think he's like make-believing friends at the moment in the background. But it's... It, it's Future Atlanta Taylor's United. like, are there 15 yeah. people yeah. in my house right now? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> wait, who is he talking to? He's, <laughs> at least he's not telling me to like be quiet. Like I have no idea. Is he playing with trains or... Yeah, no, no, no. He's, uh, I think he's playing like his little like 11 aside football right now. Anyways, <laughs> back to more important things. Future pro. Um, uh, that's the one thing that when you look at Atlanta United, a lot of young talent want to come there because they are put on a global scale. They're put on this ownership group that is willing to sell these players at a young age. And I, I the one thing that scares me with Atlanta United, if they do lose Almada in the summer, if they do lose widely in that summer window, this is a completely different Atlanta side. 
they won't be winning games like they are because they look like old school Atlanta from season one and season two with Miguel Almiron, Joseph Martinez, when all of that front, I call it like that front five where it's all integrated. Everyone's running off each other. They don't really have positions. It's get into the most dangerous goal scoring position and fill the biggest threat and then defensively just work to get back. And this is what this, this Atlanta side in 2023 is reminding me of that old Atlanta side that we had saw. So big picture, scary now, bigger picture. If they lose these two players, it's going to look like a completely different Atlanta side. So I agree with you guys. I think I'm less sold on them right now than everyone else is here. Like it's been great. Charlotte looked really bad. They blew out Charlotte. Portland have looked bad coming cross country. Noah Vander. They blew out Portland. That's awesome. San Jose Almeida carries them. Didn't think they looked great against them or Toronto. So I'm not as high, but I would. What I wonder on what Kalen was just talking about is this has been the issue the whole time. And the plan was Almiron gets sold. Joseph stays. He's the stabilizing force. Then we bring in PT. Didn't work. What will Garth Lagerway do now in management to try and alleviate the issue, which is they are going to continue to sign the Barcos and the Tiago Almadas. How do they continue to win? I think Giacomakis is part of that answer. Luis Araujo is the curveball on this whole thing. These are the best three games he's maybe ever played for Atlanta, but that's with Almada. So it'll be interesting. It feels like with Luis Abram in this team, but not playing like, there's more strength defensively. Ozzy Alonso supposed to come at some, come back at some point. Brad Guzan still in there. There's a space here where this team could be elite defensively, and then there's less pressure on the attack. Um, but this has been the story for Atlanta the whole time: was how do we be that club that brings in young players who want to play at the highest level and win World Cups and be sold to top four Premier League teams and now Newcastle United and maybe other teams with Almada and also continue to win in Major League Soccer. And so it'll be interesting now to see someone new in Garth Lager try and figure out that equation. What's the test for them? So it's at Columbus, then they're home against the Red Bulls, at NYCFC, and then at Toronto and Chicago at home. Like yeah, I think those point, next three games are... Yeah. I like Columbus so far. I think Red Bulls are a tough team to play who know their style, where I think so far Atlanta has played teams that haven't found their identity yet, and so Atlanta could impose what they wanted on them. Mm -hmm. And I, I think NYCFC at home is one of the toughest tests in Major League Soccer because of the way they know how to play in their environment. Okay. Okay. I like the pushback. You mentioned the Timbers, Dave. Injuries are an issue. So Evander didn't play in this game. He had a minutes restriction that limited in the match before that. He missed this. It makes sense. You fly cross country. You're going to play on turf. You don't play your record signing number 10, who's had a little bit of an issue integrating so far, and his health has been in question. Sebastian Blanco uh, has a knee injury. David Ayala has a knee injury. Dyron Espria is out. Jimmy Chara is out. Christian Paredes is out. Felipe Mora is out. You just keep going down this list. Juan Mosquera will be out next week on international duty. How bleak, if at all, is it for Portland, Dave? Should they be worried long term? They should be worried um, because you bring in Vander at an age where I think the assumption is he can be an Iron Man. While Sebastian Blanco is aging and the forwards are unknown, and you have Diego Chara, what his future looks like. I think that was the point. So that's one concern. The other concern is under Gio Savarese, no matter who has been healthy, going to a back five has been a solution over and over and over again at least to get results. Like they have gotten nil-nil draws, 1-0 wins over and over over his time when he's gone to a back five and been able to sit deep and defend and sort of put Mabiala and Zuparic or Liam Ridgewell, whoever it's been, in safe spots. So to lose 5-1 when that's the first time this year you've gone to that, that's worrying in a different way that's unique. That's not just who's the starting center forward. By the way, congratulations to Diego Char. He's the only field player in MLS history to play 30,000 or more regular season minutes with one club. <laughs> Absolutely incredible from Diego Char. He was one of the original expansion signings, if my memory of more than a decade ago, it feels like at this point, uh, is correct. Him and Chris Boyd. That was the uh, that was the spine they were built. Hell on. of a one-two punch. Hell of a one-two punch right there. All right, St. Louis City. Makes history, all caps, fourth straight win. No expansion team has ever done it. No Anders, not even your Sounders. They won three in a row, <laughs> and then they lost the fourth. Just in case you forgot, I don't know if you did, TBD on that one. We are using a little bit of a, I don't know, 
an interesting device to remind us of the all caps nature of city's history here. Every time they get a point, Anders will increase the font size in our rundown <laughs> for city. We're at 27 point font right now for city and history. So we'll see how many points they can rack up 12 down so far by my like back of the napkin math. It's probably going to take about 42, maybe 43 to make the playoffs in that nine seed based on history. That would mean that they basically just have to get a point per game the rest of the way. You'd think that's pretty accomplishable for this team on MLS wrap up on Apple TV, uh, MLS season pass. It's myself, Nigel Rio Coker and Jillian Sackovitz every single Saturday night at the end of the action with a highlight show for you. I, I posed a question to them. Are they going to make the playoffs? And uh, to, a, to a man and a woman, we all said yes. So uh, we're on record with that one. And they did it without Tim Parker in this game. They're doing it without Joaquin Nielsen, who's their other star center back, the DP esque quality esque center back, Tam center back, I guess, Tom, you would remind me. Um, mm-hmm. They throw in Lucas Bartlett, who was a trialist a year ago at center back, and they win 3 nothing and get their first ever shutout. And afterwards, Bradley Carnell had this to say. Is it a surprise for us? No. The boys were confident from day one. The boys were angry from day one that no one believed in them. So, yeah, we've got the chip on the shoulder. We had the chip on the shoulder. But now we've shown that it's not just about having a chip on the shoulder. That's three chip on the shoulders in, in less than three sentences. So just count with me there we can compete we can dominate we can take control and we can execute now we just have to stay grounded he warned i don't doubt this group for one single day that we don't remain humble that we don't remain eager to learn and commit i just want to keep this going right now the motto is comfortable but not satisfied that was an interpretive reading i don't know his inflection there i just tried to imagine what i would feel like saying it uh and and to add like that mentality or vibe that's coming from Bradley Carnell. Like Klaus said almost the same thing in, in his post-game interview. He's like, as everyone knows, no one believed in us before the season. Like we trust each other. We trust the people we're working with. Like every, like these guys got that dog in them and like they're ready to talk about it already. I was joking after their third win when I was writing something about the club. I was like, yeah, like if you get like if you guys are ready to start putting up the middle fingers for to all the doubters or whatever, like it was like, nah, not yet, but I'll let you know when. Like, so like the, they have that in them and they're ready to tell you about it like they were after this game. Yeah, they had the big foam middle fingers on order. So they're like, yeah, hold on, <laughs> just give us one more game to do this. Could we say that they're the new laminators of 2023? Def- definitely the most likely laminators. I'm going to put it that yeah, way. Big time laminators. Kaylin, what are you seeing on the field from from St. Louis City? I think for me, I mean, you touched on like the first two games of the season. Okay. Maybe a little bit of luck, but now you can't call them lucky anymore. I mean, they have 11 goals for only one goal against you. You just touched on it with players being out due to injury. Tim Parker being one of the main pivotal center back spine of this team and Players just seem to be able to slot in, know their role, do it extremely well. Someone like an Indiana Vasilev, whether you start him, you bring him off the bench, he knows his role. Leuven in the midfield is just that solid, you know, box-to-box midfielder that you love to have in your team. But this team, for me, which is scary for an expansion side, because usually with expansion sides, you don't really know how they're going to play. It's usually long, win the seconds, make it an ugly game, make it a dirty game, get stuck into tackles. Well, this St. Louis side actually can play both ways. So they have the target number nine with Klaus that they can play those long balls in. He's great at bringing it down. But then all of a sudden he makes magic. You forget he's Brazilian. You forget he's got smooth and silky feet. And then you forget that you have late running midfielders that create the overlaps, the underlaps. And it just seems players are coming from everywhere. They can also play out of the back from their center backs. They're confident enough to play out of the back. Obviously, Berkey being an experienced goalkeeper, he's got the distribution, whether it's from his hands, whether it's from his feet. So that's a dangerous tool as well, because in Major League Soccer, usually you don't have a goalkeeper that can do all of that, whether it's, you know, playing short balls out of the back great long ball service as well. And then the abilities to throw and then to have the communication. I mean, he's the complete package for me, the St. Louis side. I mean, the recruiting department, I would love to meet them. I'd love to be locked inside a room with them because they've seemed to check every single box. And this team for me is going to be scary moving forward. I think, I think the confidence is just building. Um, And we touched a lot of people were touching on depth with this side, but you're even starting to see depth with, not experienced players in major league soccer stepping up and getting the job done and having a clean sheet against a San Jose side. So I think that's kind of telling you the story of the depth charts there. It's not the big name depth chart people that maybe you'd see the game changing moments, but it's players that know their role and they know how St. Louis want to play. I just want to nail down on that point. Cause I think it's a great point, Kaylin. And, and Lucas Bartlett is sort of in this match, the shining example 
But he's sixth overall pick in 2021 to Dallas, but he was not going to play for Dallas. He played in MLS Next Pro. They had him on trial until literally a week ago. Until one week ago, and they signed him to a contract. He starts and gets the first shutout in club history in the second ever game at home. It's incredible. Look at their expansion draft. Like when we did that draft, I walked away thinking, ah, you know, I don't know. I like, you know, like uh, Giacchini is that's a good upside pick. Like Tim Parker in a trade for assets, that's good, but we haven't seen the best of him in Houston. Maybe we'll see the best of him now, but he's kind of getting up there a little bit in age. Indiana Vasilev, can they even get him signed? You know, I had to figure that out, period. John Nelson is like, yeah, that's a good, that's a good pick, but is he a starter? Is he a backup? Where's he at on that? You look at, at their roster build, and they were very they were very public about the fact that they weren't going to go spend huge amounts of money. But they were super effective in the places where you just thought, well, that's kind of a wild card. Like, you know, I know Jared Stroud is a guy that Matt Doyle is like, he's so good, he's so good. But we hadn't seen it consistently, and he hadn't really played last year in Austin. They got all these guys, Kyle Hebert out of MLS Next Pro, like Jake Nerwinski. From Vancouver, Tom, like this is why I get really passionate about internal MLS transfer market and movement <laughs> because there's a lot of talent that sometimes just not, is not in the right spot. And the more we can get that talent in the right spot, the better league we're going to have. That's see, by the way, if you're watching on Apple TV or YouTube, we just saw the next generation of talent at the Kyle household coming around the corner. Oh, God. But Tom, this this was a, a roster build that got some it got some flack. And we focused on that, like, no designated player, designated team headline. <laughs> and now we're getting that big foam middle finger. Yeah, look, the, uh, they did a, a, a numerous things really well. Um, first of all, they made their first signing a year be- more than a year before their first game. They had nine players signed by, I think, July or August. And not only were they all signed, but they were all in market in St. Louis. They didn't loan them. And, like, there's one argument where, well, yeah, like, Klaus, Berkey, they're not Loven, they're not playing first team football for for a half a year or whatever, right? And they they're just kind of training, but it worked out so well. And like I was speaking with Loven about this, that he's like, I'm so happy that I was here six months early. He's, he's like, I I needed this time to settle in. So they did that really well. Bradley Carnell was an awesome hire. He had the perfect blend of really high level MLS experience with the Red Bulls for five years, and he was the interim manager for a little while before Gerhard Struber came. Um, and he's somebody who aligns with Lutz Van Etzel in the Geek and pressing and, and, and their transition like that from a man down, uh, top down was the, the ideal and the vision and the goal and everybody's aligned and bought in. So that helps with roster building because you know exactly what you're looking for. And another kind of nugget on, on Bradley Carnell. Remember when Chris Armas was an assistant with Manchester United under Ralph Rangnick? Carnell was in line for that as well. And he ended up turning it down and staying here. And that worked out brilliantly for him. And he's now doing really well at St. Louis. And, and like, again, it just kind of shows where he was viewed at by, again, Ralph Rangnick is like the, the father of modern geek and pressing. He's somebody who's influenced Klopp and, and a bunch of other coaches, David, uh, coaches, David Wagner. So like Bradley Carnell has been awesome. And that's why the structure has been here. And that's why you look at the, the, the lineup. And, and my last point here, like I said, Nelson, Bartlett, Stroud, Vaslov, Giacchini, Heber, Nerwinski. Those are seven players who weren't regulars at their clubs. These are seven players that anybody could have had. And they all played really well for their first win and their first shot out. And can I just say something picking off your point? Because I love that you touched on they got the players into market early. You don't realize how big of an advantage that is. And and it almost seems like, why weren't other teams doing this before? Why don't other expansion teams even think of this? Money is, is part of it. You have you have to sure. pay MLS MLS wages a half a season before you. So like St. Louis ownership deserves credit for that. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. But it's it's a huge thing because you come to America. Obviously, it's it's a difficult place to come because the background checks, trying to get a car. It sounds so simple trying to move your family to a different country because you're thinking, yeah, we're going to America. Tough to find, get a house because you don't have any credit score, don't have cars, you don't have cell phones, you don't have your, you know, all your forms and everything, your social security. So I I love that they did this. As a wife married to a footballer, that is the dream. Someone getting you there early so you're not stressed out through season and your husband's not stressed out through season. He can just literally focus on soccer. So uh, in the Done. chat here. <laughs> Rant over. Uh, it's, a, it's a great point and you've lived it. So... Uh, none of us have. Right, they I mean, are living he, it. And, and people have says, asked me over and over again, like, what's the comparison of this expansion team? And I've said Nashville because they did have a team and they did sign players and they did have a system and they did have coherency. And that is one of the advantages. Now, having MLS Next Pro pop up the year 
that you came in and, and as Tom said, paid the money and made that decision. That's all, you know, some of it was convenient, sort of, but you also had ownership that came in that was running a USL team in St. Louis City FC. So you had all of those elements that were able, that this team was able to do. And Bradley Carnell seemed to comfortably sort of take the role of not being the coach of that team, but being there the whole time. Mm-hmm. And it was like the perfect thing that happened for them. And um, it has led to depth where expansion, some MLS teams don't have, let alone expansion teams. So the coach of that next pro team is John Hackworth, which goes back again to how you build a team, the people that you have around the team. John Hackworth understands uh, better than most what it takes um, and has a uh, just a, an understanding of the environment and the connections and the scouting that needs to play, take place to get that depth. Uh, Anders is saying, quote, some amazing revisionist history going on here. I don't know what you're talking about, Anders. I've always <laughs> thought that St. Louis City uh, SC was going to be all caps, very good. And I'm just basking in the glow of my uh, successful predictions right now. But we do have David Goss on this show. And Dave, I see the I see the storm clouds gathering. We just got out from under the Atlanta uh, showers. Can you please come and rain on this parade? Well, yes. let me start with this. Let me not start with the raining and let me say for a team to come so into the thundering, league, but the rain. Has no, make it rain. Run. Make yeah. it rain. For a team come to on come now. into this league that has a club called New York City FC owned by an organization called the City Football Group that also own teams like Manchester City, men's and women's, Melbourne City, men's and women's, Mumbai City, to take City all caps as the moniker to win it in four weeks that might be the greatest thing st louis has done so far so credit to them the rain on the parade is they played well in this game and i said last week and i still feel the biggest key for this team is they play in the attacking half their mistakes don't hurt them um but uh jameer montero didn't start in this game carlos correso comes off hurt michael baldissimo's first play was the lost tackle that led to the first goal klaus had a no look pass go off a defender back to his foot the second goal and Thomas Ostruck scored a deflected goal in the third. So again, St. Louis are doing some great things, but <laughs> you're getting some fortunate moments as well to play. Get out of here with that. It's to get it's a team missing that. two St- starting center mids and to be able to take St- advantage uh, centrally. St. Louis, St. Louis supporters just on Twitter. I would just uh, at empire goss yeah. for, first of all, two S's on all goss. caps, all caps. Correct. <laughs> second of all, that sounded like that sounded like he's trying to push the lucky narrative. I, I, I'm just telling you what I'm hearing. That's it. Uh, so, and, and, and we're we're talking, guys. You pointed to uh, San Jose missing a couple midfielders. St. Louis were without their top three center backs. Yep. Teams in this league don't succeed. They don't get clean sheets when they're missing one center back, like or two center. Like I don't know. I, I think that's the most impressive point is how many again like unheralded players or air quote depth players that contributed to this game. Like it's I don't know. Like I've. I don't. I don't know how many times. Like I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over. That like yeah, like this role players or the lesser players, they can they're put in more conducive environments to succeed when it's such a, a cohesive, when it's such a, a detailed um, structure and system that that they all know. So it's easy to kind of just step right in. There's no DP in team, is what we're saying right now. Let's talk about when this uh, might end. They're at RSL next. RSL had a bye week in match day four. And then they're home against Minnesota. Then it's at Seattle. Then it's home against Cincinnati. At Seattle and Cincinnati is for sure like, hey, are you for real against the upper echelon? At RSL, home against Minnesota. Can they win? I mean, we're talking crazy now. Let's talk real crazy. Can they win both of those games and go six for six? Is it is it possible, Kaylin? I see you making a face. I think Real Salt Lake is going to be difficult because it's a difficult place to go and play. The altitude, it's very, very tough. Um, Minnesota, no chance against Minnesota <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but no, look, they're they're riding a high, but four games undefeated, teams start to look at you a little bit differently. They start to scout you a little bit differently. They start to maybe go a little bit more in depth. So I think for this side, I think Real Salt Lake will be very difficult. Obviously at home, that plays a massive advantage against Minnesota side. Um, and a lot of their players coming back from international break. Seven of them will be returning back for international break for that. So don't know if Adrian Heath will rest players or if they'll be fit enough to play or if, you know, someone does pick up an injury on international duty. But, I mean, anything is possible, but I do think the RSL game is going to be very difficult to pick up three points. Two weeks to scout, by the way. I mean, they've been digging into these games. We'll have RSL. Uh, How about this? Ceiling and floor, Dave. What is the ceiling? What is the floor for this team? St. Louis? Yeah. 
I mean, they're already nine points above the playoff line in the West. So I think the floor is playoffs. Like, I would be surprised if this is a team with the depth they're showing and the cohesion they're showing and they're, um, the way they don't make mistakes so they don't beat themselves, right? You look at the first three weeks of the season, you see a lot of teams, self-inflicted wounds, going down 1-0, going down 2-1, going down in home games, dropping points because of self-inflicted issues that St. Louis doesn't make. Uh, I don't think you have a heavy roster of internationals in this team, which is something we're starting to talk about now as the international breaks come, where I think you're going to be consistent over and over and potentially can add them in the summer where you see holes that you need to. So I'd say the floor is ninth right now um, for St. Louis. And why wouldn't you say the ceiling is the top of the West if they're there right now? Why wouldn't you, right? Yeah, you right here from the storm cloud himself. Top of the West. I just, I just <laughs> call it how I see it. I got I no opinion on the matter. I, I don't hate. I know. There's I love not it. a cheese in the world I dislike. Like I'm open to everything. Oh, no, boy. stop. There's got to be one you hate. No, I like. My doctor tells me I. Like I was gonna say cheese might, cheese might hate you. <laughs> cheese hates you if yeah. we're gonna if we're gonna go that route. All we right, know. we won't hit the quakes too hard here. They were missing some players. I don't think this is some big overarching you know, sort of like indication of where their season is heading. They've shown really good uh, signs early on. And I and will say, I think they'll be happy that they tried to play through the pressure. It was not the reason they gave up any of the goals. And like, they have a style that they are committing to. All right, if let's Bruce move on. Asel's not out for a really long time. Yeah, let's move on. Houston Dynamo hand Austin uh, an L in a non-Copa Tejas Texas Derby match. If that makes any sense to you, the first two Texas Derbies don't count. Who decided Copa Tejas. That? Uh, the supporters groups. Okay. They're the, the ones Copa that are yeah. Because bases. it all has to be, you need like, you need equal matchups to decide it on points. And because of the way the schedule works, you're not getting that. So it'd be two X, we'll call them bonus games within the Copa Tejas. So you have to eliminate those games. And fortunately for Austin, they lose a game that got eliminated from Copa Tejas, of which they are the holders. But we are starting with the Houston Dynamo. Houston Arrow says, talk Dynamo to me. So, Tom, talk Dynamo. You had Hector Herrera. Give us more on the Houston Dynamo in this performance. Yeah, it was a really big win. Um, it was. It showed like kind of what they're trying to build under under Ben Olsen, and and he even spoke to, about it in his post game press conference. He's like, look, it was really important for us to get the first win. Like, and, you know, coaches can say whatever they want, but he's like, you, you need to win. And obviously, it's a results driven business. Um, Amin Basi scoring his first goal, a penalty. It's still on the board. That's big. Hector Herrera looked really good, I thought. He looked really engaged, again, like the, the way that he was leading, the way he was covering ground. He led the team in, in passes. He was only off the game leader in ground co- distance covered by like two-tenths of a, of a mile, which, again, like this that's going to lend itself to central midfielders who play 90 minutes. But still, like to see him all the way up at the top with, with Artur was the one who kind of led the game. Like these are good little signs that you can point to is, OK, like he really is engaged. He really is going around. It's a big win for Houston. Um, I was really surprised to see Sebastian Ferreira not in the starting lineup. We have to monitor that and see if if that was just kind of a, a tactical decision by Ben Olsen or if maybe they think Corey Baird can give them something different to get both Bossy and, and Frank, uh, Franco on the field together. So, yeah, this was a really big win for Houston. And, you know, it's 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 been a tough week and a half for Austin FC. I'll say that. Uh, very tough. Before we get to Austin, you reported that the Dynamo are finalizing a center back acquisition on TAM. Eric yeah. Sviachenko from Michelin in Denmark. And it seems like uh, MLS teams are going after basically the captains of Danish teams. You saw Andreas Maxu <laughs> go to the Rapids as well. Uh, walk me through this. Yeah, so I, I was kind of pleasantly surprised to see that they were able to find a TAM signing in the budget. And I think that's uh, spending that at center back was smart for them. He's somebody, again, with, with Maxo in, in Colorado. The idea is that Svachenko can be the defensive anchor and somebody that makes it a little bit easier for Teenage uh, Hadabe uh, to play and kind of perform where he's not the one that's, you know, looked at as the guy in defense. So he had, he's got five caps with Denmark. He hasn't been with the national team in a while, uh, but still five caps, five caps. He started all six Europa League group stage games uh, as uh, he played alongside uh, Evander, who was leading the Europa League in assists before he went to Portland. So yeah, this, this player has a profile, a really strong profile of, of, of a kind of a key win now in prime type signing. Interesting to look at their passing map for the Dynamo in this game. Coco Karaskia is actually the furthest player forward, but you see a really tight triangle there with Baird uh, and Hector Herrera and Bassi kind of in that left channel. So we'll see what lasts for them as far as the attacking side goes. They've really prioritized possession. 
uh, this year. And Austin had some spells, but uh, we've seen Houston take a step forward with this result. And Austin took a step back, and Josh Wolf said it afterwards. You've got seven shots in this match. And I was surprised to see him come out and call out basically every attacker not named Sebastian Driussi. Like, I understand that going on behind the scenes, but uh, he is making a point. And he went after Diego Fagundes with a little bit of length there, basically saying, we need more. Last year is last year. He got a new contract. We need him to be a game changer week to week. And there's just no doubt that that is true. He went after Rigoni as well, who had a couple moments in this game, but didn't convert. Like, that's been the conversation for a long time there. He said it about Giassi Zardes who got benched in this one for Maxi Arruti, and understandably so. Giassi had no shots on goal through four games. Um, anybody have any thoughts on on where Austin is at right now? Is it is it super concerning? I mean, Dylan Biles hit us up and said, how much of what Austin is experiencing is the echo effects of Gabrielson leaving and then Cascante going down versus there being something more problematic embedded in the system Wolf is trying to play? It is pretty clear that they need Owen Wolf on the field. So I, I'm starting to understand why he was the one who started over who the former captain and Alex Ring, who now they need at center back. Like, is it a cascading issue or is it something bigger? What do we think? Anybody have deep thoughts? Kaylin's struggling because I know she was high on Austin. <laughs> I was high on Austin. It's I put them back in. I put them, I like, obviously, because the other guys took the other teams, LAFC, you know, Seattle Sounders. So I did Austin being top of the Western Conference. I, I mean, I'm really, really disappointed. And, you know, I was really hard on, on Wolf getting the start in this side and obviously Ring finding himself on the bench and then the center back injury. So then he starts. But for me, if you're willing, and again, he deserves to play now. He, he scored his goal. He's been, he's looked good. But that does have a rippling effect within a club. I mean, sitting your captain that has never really done wrong for the club, wasn't playing bad football, and then putting him in a center back role, you can't be happy with that. Do you know what I mean? Yes, you're still on the pitch now, but you're on the pitch because of an injury. I don't know. And then going after players in, in the public, like as a player, I get it. You need like you need to have a little bit of bark, but this team's down at the moment. They also need a little bit of nurturing as well. Um especially obviously getting knocked out of CONCACAF Champions League. That one was like a head scratcher for everyone because they should mm -hmm. not be knocked out of the CONCACAF Champions League. Let's just be completely honest. They have too much talent on this team. I think right now it's just, it feels probably chaotic. It probably feels chaotic at training, not making sense. Players are frustrated. Players are frustrated in, in one another, maybe in the managerial side of who he's selecting, who he's dropping. But I feel like this team will come together. I feel like they do have the players on the team where they're like, hey, we got to get back on track. we got to get back on winning ways. Um, but it's going to come down to someone like a ring that steps up with the leadership and saying, guys, this isn't good enough. Like the manager can say all they want, but at the end of the day, it comes down to the player's performance on the pitch. I'm, I'm really worried about them just because they're, they're too soft in central defense. Like, again, you go back to the first leg. Uh, and CCL, like it's just too easy to play through. Look where yeah, that was Nick Lima, Nick Lima, and Amaral Tarek. Yeah, but I mean, but if Alex Ring is playing center back, that's an issue. Like they moved him from six to eight last year, and that was like one of the key reasons as to why their defense got. Obviously, Gabrielson was was really really good, but one of the the bigger wrinkles was Danny Pereira coming into the team and playing more as a number six than a box to box midfielder, so Ring could go do more stuff. Now Ring is playing as a center back, like that's that's a failure of a roster build right now. Like I don't. I'm not sure that's going to get better. And they're going to score goals, sure, but you you cannot consistently pick up points. You can't pick up enough points w w without a, a better defense, without a better structure to be top three or top four in the West. So I'm really worried about this team. Uh, you know, if Isonen looks better and and he can be somebody that that can do 85 percent, 90 percent of Gabrielle's, and that'll be key. But but right now, like I think that there's too many question marks in central defense or kind of again through that defensive spine. I think so it's what? clear that the depth is the issue, right? Like yeah, they have Look, big. Issues with depth. Yo, is, do Johan, they though? Johan Valencia? Yeah, I don't know that they. Yes, do. I don't think yes, they, they do. do. Not at all. No, Alex no. Ring is playing center back. That that is that is an indictment of where that they are in the that's roster. Due to, that's Johan, due to Johan, injury, though. I will say, but one injury. It was one injury. But, but, no, no, it compared to other major league soccer teams, I wouldn't say Austin is yeah. short on depth. If okay, you're doing, I would. How about this? Compared to other teams, that's also not one injury. By the way, Amra Tarek is also out. Yeah, it's Kip so Keller wasn't even backs. in the eighteen. It, wasn't even in the eighteen. If, if you're if you're leaning on Armro Tarek to be a, a you know twenty game starting, then that's an indictment of your depth, and that's an indictment of the roster. Like Johan Valencia, I, like I thought he was going to be really good. He has not been good. That 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 was a you know two million dollar signing. Like Rigoni, we we've, we've all kind of taken shots at him. He's not been good at a four, like Ronnie Ronnie Reddish does not look issues. like an MLS player. The, the those are supposed to be depth. Are. 
The center back ones are. I agree with you that the likes of Ragoni, maybe even Valencia, given the the number on him, is not depth. But center back is. Like the center back depth was poor last year, and they got by because nobody got hurt. This year, the replacements weren't good. And, and maybe you're right, Dave. That maybe that's not about quote, quote unquote depth. It's about the decisions. But the decisions is then reflected in the lack of depth. Who is the fourth center back on Seattle? Who is the third center back on Dallas? Who is the third center back on Minnesota? I'm just I mean, Jose Martinez is probably the third center back on Dallas, Coast. and he's a TAM signing. Jose Martinez is not the okay. third center back. He's Fine. the second. Ibiaga is. Or is he the Ibiaga third? is. They don't Ibiaga know. Is. He just won MLS Cup. Ibiaga is the guy who passed it back in the first game against Minnesota. Okay, but he just won MLS Cup. And then they lost 1-0 at home because he started. Kelly like, Acosta is not happy to play center back, Dave. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one, I actually don't think this whole thing with Ring is bad because Owen Wolf gives them more, essentially. I agree, I agree with that. I think it's bad mentally and how the situation was maybe potentially handled. For his career, it's not great. But for, for the Scott's team, I don't, think, whole time. I don't think it's that much worse. <laughs> but I will say I thought Austin would regress in the season because I thought they maxed out what they could do. The key for them is to show they could win and knock out competitions. But they did it in the playoffs last year. So to come back and lose in CCL is so much bigger for them because I don't think it was about Supporter Shield this year. I think it was about legitimately being a League's Cup and MLS Cup contender. All right, we got a halftime break here. We've got some uh, issues with Dave's connection and uh, the level of fire. It's just we got yeah, to take a break. We'll, be, we'll be right back. <laughs> All right, we're back. And, uh, Kaylin, that was a little bit like, you know, being at a friend's house and all of a sudden your friend and their family starts fighting. You're like, am I supposed to be here? Do I leave? I thrive in those situations, Andrew. <laughs> I was literally just stirring the pot. Hey, you know what? <laughs> so does CF Montreal. Those are their favorite situations, too. Yeah. And they win 3-2 at uh, the Big O over the Philadelphia Union. Uh, one of four teams, including the Dynamo, to get their first win of 2023. We're going to rattle through some of these. But first, got to explain sort of what happened if you were watching stoppage time from, oh, about the 89th minute to the 99th minute of this match. Because... In the 89th minute, Philadelphia Union were up 2-1 and sort of cruising even down a man, thinking, oh, we're about to close this thing off, get a nice three points on the road, and they lose 3-2. Afterwards, Montreal head coach Hernan Lasada said, the game tonight is hard to explain, but the best answer is that this is soccer. <laughs> Which, uh, that doesn't sound like an answer, Hernan, but I'll take it uh, at face value. Jim Curtin said it slightly differently, which was the word blank show comes to mind. Just want to save Anders the the bleep here and the work on the edit, but I think you understand what kind of show Jim was talking about. So here's what happened. Two, one Philly in the 89th minute. Montreal starts pushing cross comes in header goes off the crossbar. Chinoso four scores. Montreal celebrates. They're all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it goes to goals given. So just uh, that's established. The goal is given. Montreal goes, the VAR, Daniel Radford, flags it. The referee goes to the monitor, calls the goal off for offside. And when you're watching it, you're only seeing really the broadcast angles. It's like, you know, I did instant replay and I was like, oh, yeah. And, and the night of as well, I was like, oh, yeah, offside for sure, for sure, for sure. Because you can only see a limited part of the field. Well, the goal's called off and Hernan, Hernan Lozada is like, time out, guys. What's going on? He's going crazy. Victor Wanyama had a quote on this one that says he went over to the Montreal bench and watched the replay, and then went back to the referee and complained, complained to the fourth official, said, you got to communicate with the video assistant referee up there and get this one right because you guys are wrong because Kai Wagner, who had chased down the crosser, is clearly keeping the entire thing onside. We get a double video review. The VR flags the referee back. Goal stands after being taken off, and here we are. And then, by the way, Romo Kyoto scores a game winner in the 98th. Dave, this is just it is it is like Montreal at the big O. It's pure energy and it's wonderful. Yeah, it's the long ball to Cam Porter from Callum Malice all over again. It was yeah, it was ridiculous. Um I mean, I, I guess it's a good thing that the refs got it right eventually. That's the point of VAR. I think you'd prefer to not have to review your own right. VAR to get it right. You'd <laughs> want to just do it once. Um, but at least they end up with the correct call, which is that Kai Wagner is holding him on. The comedic part of the whole thing is Kai Wagner is the most upset about the call. He's like, oh, he's yelling at the ref before they overturn it. Then he's yelling at the ref again after. Then at the end of the game, he was the one who had to be restrained. 
because I think he thought there was a foul on 04 um, on the goal when it was scored, or he committed a foul in the end. But on the 04 one point. or the Romo Kyoto one? Because Kyoto I, just. So he, he goes up to the ref when Hernan Lozada is getting the yellow card after the 04 goal and is doing this and yelling at the ref, saying there was an arm. So I don't know where he thought that arm was. Um, and then, yeah, they all had complaints about the Romel Kyoto goal. But we said it, I think, last week. Montreal hadn't played home yet. There's a home heavy league. That's Major League Soccer. So you couldn't worry about them yet. Um, I actually liked some of what Hernan Lozada did in this game. I like Saliba and Zuhir next to Wanyama. They both cover more ground. And rather than forcing one to be a 10 and one to be a six, you let them both play both roles. And I thought it helped them a lot. Mason Toy gave them some life up top because now you don't need numbers all the time in the attack. Him and Kyoto can attack by themselves, hold up for a little bit, get Lapa line in up the right side, which leads to the first goal. And anytime Matthew Schwanier is on the field, you know, I'm happy because that guy has to be on the field. Give me some. Um, so they, I thought they showed commitment to all of that. I thought they battled with Philly as much as you can. And like they probably fed into Philly style too much, but Lasada wants the same thing. He wants open games. He wants direct games. They're going to have to live with stuff like this. So for them to get the emotional three points and get Kyoto sticking the fingers in the air, it's a positive day. I, I agree with you. And, and also, I think the, the red car with Julian Carranza was a momentum shift because it allowed Montreal to like mentally be like, OK, 69th minute, 20 minutes to go. We can definitely do this. And they looked a little bit more attacking than we've seen in other games. They were living in the final third. Was it pretty at times? No, but at least they were getting the ball into wide areas. And like you alluded to with having Mason Toy up top, I thought it completely changed how Montreal has been playing. They didn't really have an identity. I know they've lost a lot of players, but he's got to start for me. He's got to start for me in the side. And and to be able to do it, you, you touch on going home. They're not even actually at home home yet. Like they're playing the Olympic stadium because obviously the weather conditions, I think, correct me if I'm wrong at their actual stadium. Um, obviously I played in that Olympic stadium. The turf is not the best. I think they've changed it out since then. It's this it's one was really... brand new. This was the first game on the new one. Oh, okay. Amazing. Because it had to be, um, <laughs> Like it was terrible. It went from cement um, to carpet over the. Yeah, last it went week. from like you have no <laughs> knees, no Achilles, no shins to amazing. Um, so yeah, hats off to Montreal, and, and it's great they needed it. They needed this as a confidence booster because I think everyone, me included, have been really critical on them. So as a player, when you're always hearing the critical side of things to have a result like that in, in the fashion that they did, that's going to help build into the next game. Pretty incredible passing map for them, by the way. It's like a two pronged trident on one side is basically the entire team from Kyoto to Toy to Saliba, Schwanier, Schwanier. And then on the other side, it's just Lassie Lapaline and all by himself. <laughs> it's like, all right, Lassie, get up there, whip it in. We're going to the back post. That's how they got two goals. So uh, well done. Rita Zuhir is our 20, 20, uh, 22 under 22 player of the weekend as well. Here's a quick question for you, Tom. Ryan Landis said, we celebrated the union keeping their starting 11 intact from last year, but have other teams taken big enough steps forward where being good as last year won't cut it this year? Or is this just CONCACAF Champions League and a crazy moment that shouldn't have happened? Correct. If they, if Julian Carranza doesn't get sent off, they, I, I'm very confident that they easily they sit on that lead and take three points. They just kind of blew out Alianza. Like, I don't know. I, I have zero worries about this team. Like, I think that they've gotten better because of all the depth that they had. Yeah, again, this would have been a great time for the depth to come through with, with three points. But, again, a red card changes the game. I don't know. This is still clearly the best team in the East for me. And, and it's going to take a lot to shake my uh, belief of that. Just know every depth comment is directed at you, Dave. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> who was that? Who was Philly's third center back last year? Uh, that's fair. Brandon Craig. Stuart Finley. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> Yeah, that's fair. Oxford that's, United, Stuart Finley. Yeah, yeah, that's Legend. the pride of Oxford United. No, 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 but Weeby knows how to, an MLS roster should be built. So exactly. Uh, he'll exactly. I'm glad you've acknowledged the, that. Put that all straight, the depth and talent across Straight into the intro there. And, 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 and hold, that kind I, cut. Weeby, I think Goss is making our point because they went out and traded for Damian Lowe because they were like, we really need a third center back. Like, they, they're planned for this. We can't really Is Damian Lowe the answer, though? Yes, the third, third center back, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Orlando one, Charlotte two, uh, and Swiderski and Josephak go to the bench. Capetti and Kerwin Vargas score, and Charlotte gets their first win, Dave. There's two parts to this. The Josephak Swiderski is one side, which is there's no world in which Charlotte's better this year without Swiderski being a difference maker for them. I don't know exactly what's going on right now. He's supposed to go and play with Poland. Maybe it's just we're not in agreement. He's not helping. Let's get you a rest. Go play for Poland. Play well. 
you know, fresh setting, start alongside Lewandowski, do your thing. When you come back, let's reset the relationship. That's the hope. But on the soccer side, this was the best performance for Charlotte by far this year. They bring Bronico back into midfield alongside Jones. Uh, that gives them stability, more to play through, harder to play through for Orlando centrally, which forced a lot more out wide. Credit to Jalen Lindsay. He was the starter at right back. He lost his spot last year. He comes back in and played a really good game here um, to stabilize things for them, even though the mistakes ends up coming from Bill Tuiloma sort of on his side, and he had the ball over the top. Yeah, Yeah. and he had the ball. Oh, but, you know, starting center back, step, all that stuff in Major League Soccer, right? Uh, I will say this, though. Capetti looked phenomenal in this game, and not just for himself. He sets up a chance for gains in the first five minutes. He dips his shoulder. He's faking shots to get to the end line, to get guys into spots. He's tracking back when center midfielders pass him as runners to cover for them. Uh, And so I thought this was the best game he's played. He looks like a really good signing. And then they got threat from the wings. Fargus and McKenzie Gaines trying to be goal dangerous, trying to be direct. It's one of the better games games McKenzie Gaines has played in terms of final third decision making that we've seen. It's not just being part of goals. It's, you know, consistently it was one touch shot, one touch pass. And that was really big for them as well. Uh, Last shout out to George Marks. Like him playing through pressure creates the goal for them. That's Mm -hmm. a 22 year old starting goalkeeper in MLS who had no intention of being that this year. Like that's being prepared. That's being ready. Yeah. I mean, the, the the biggest disappointment in Charlotte, the first three weeks of the season was just, it it reminded me of what Vanny Sartini did after he got the full-time job, what Christian Latanzio was doing. He, took everything that he did well that earned him this job and just scrapped it and went way too overcomplicated. Playing Brand Bronico as like an inverted left back made no sense. Their best moments last year were Carol Swiderski as a second forward underneath Daniel Rios and Brant Bronico next to Derek Jones in the midfield so he can play more than eight than a six. And the first three games of the season, they didn't do that. And I don't understand why coaches overcomplicate things. So I think it was a good development that he played a, a fullback at fullback and he didn't put Carol Swiderski on the wing. Again, I was surprised to not see him in the starting lineup playing through the center, but like just don't overcomplicate the game and it'll be easier. So hopefully this is a step in the right direction. Hopefully we do not see Brand Bronco as a left back for the rest of the season. But again, uh, this this was a really important bounce back performance and statement by uh, Charlotte. Big Westwood bounce back. went off hurt at halftime also, by the way. So that's something to track. That's a 30 plus year old center mid that mm-hmm. gave a decent chunk of money to. Uh, a lot of chunks of money given out in Toronto. They won 2-0 against Miami. Kalen, big win for them. They needed a win. Bob Bradley said, hey, sometimes teams in cold weather cities start slow. That's, you know, we're inside training. <laughs> what? He's bringing out With the three weather. away games? He's bringing to out be the weather. Fair, to be fair, I will. I, I'm kind. I am favoring towards Bob Bradley on this one because it is difficult. I've been to the Toronto grounds. I've been to Minnesota. It's completely different because you have the dome. So you actually, you can't hit service how you would normally hit it outside. I know that sounds absolutely insane and crazy, but I do feel I do feel sorry for for teams that live in cold weather situations that have to train in a bubble. Keep going. But this was a much better performance. <laughs> Their best performance on the season. Jonathan Osorio gets a goal. Mark Anthony K gets a goal. Uh, Fede Bernadeschi is involved in both and he remains the shining light. What did Toronto show you in this game? And are you feeling any pangs of uh, doubt and or regret about your devotion to Inter Miami? No. No, 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 I don't. I'll get to Inter Miami in a hot moment. Okay. But Toronto, this is what I wanted to see from Toronto. It, it took them four weeks to get a performance that I thought, yeah, you spend this amount of money, you put that amount of money into players, you should be having performances like this. For me, it's that right hand side, Richie Lorena, Richie Larea, excuse me, and Bernadeschi. That is probably for me the most dynamic wing fullback partnership in major league soccer because the amount that Richie Larea covers um, whether it's inside outside the underlapping runs he just and and a menace inside that 18 yard box you you could tell that game he was he was a little bit more careful to go to ground obviously because he got the yellow card the last game um, for simulation but I I love that dynamic I, I think Michael Bradley is just doing what Michael Bradley does best in this match anyways, he sat in front. He didn't try to do anything too crazy. He is getting, you know, at the later end of his career. So you have to be smarter. You have to make the young midfield run for you like the Mark Anthony Kays. I, I thought it was a it was a good performance. Why are you laughing? It's the truth. That yeah, that's smart. Truth. That's yeah. It's, yeah. that's that's Brandon what makes, 
New yeah. blood. <laughs> New blood. <laughs> but I mean, you look you look at older players. That's what makes them better because they're smart. They know that they can't cover the amount of ground that they used to cover. They they know that their bodies just can't output that energy anymore. So um, yeah, this is what I want to see from Toronto. I know the question marks around Insigne. There's a lot of stuff going around that may be on loan to Galatasaray in the summer transfer window, which would be really interesting. Um, I don't want to say it's a good thing for Major League Soccer, but I think potentially maybe a, a good thing for Toronto um, if they can get another player in. Um, obviously, we, I think he's a fantastic check, player, but... Can we just check with Tom real quick to see if there's any Tom... Uh, Tom, breaking news? Insigne <laughs> to Galatasaray, or is this just some good rumor milling? I haven't I haven't asked around yet because this kind of came out right before we did the show. I want to point out that the reports were the club's president is interested in signing Lorenzo Insigne on loan. I will tell you that there are a lot of clubs interested in signing players on a free loan where the uh, the parent club holds a lot of the salary. And and again, like and and not to generalize, but there are uh, the rumor mill in Turkey is works overtime compared oh, to yeah. uh, a more place. So I'm just gonna believe it when I see it. On the but, but is this team? But is this team? Might come here on loan. Yeah. <laughs> Genuinely, is this team for you better with or without him? Obviously, he's a fantastic with. player. But you have have you seen a game where you think with Insigne that it's been consistent week in and week out from when he was signed last season or into this season before he picked up the injury? So the way I will word it is they are better with him than without him right now. If they were able to get out of his deal, that would be a miracle for Toronto. So, yeah, Kalen, I, I, that, like, the, if that's kind of the lane you're going, then, like, yeah, I think that's fair. But, like, obviously, just, just in general, like, I, and I, you can't bring in another DP if he leaves on loan. So I, I don't know why Toronto would Unless they get that. paid but, something, right? Unless there's a loan. Yeah, and it goes into, like, the roster rules. And But, again, but then what happens? You sign a DP and Lorenzo and Senior returns in six months, and now you have 40 Ps. And now everybody knows you have 40 Ps, and you either have to buy them out or, or lose uh, th- somebody. Th- th- Unless Oso can know, drop just, down. But I'm just talking True. about the team, though, the team aspect of it. They seemed more of a team in this game without him. And obviously, everyone knows the Insigne stuff behind the scenes, mm-hmm. with the national team, with not getting along with players, da 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 And when you have that big money in and around your name, you want it to make it about you. But this Toronto side, I mean, you look at Bernadeschi, it's not about him. It's not about Richie Larea. It's not about He's Michael Bradley. It's not about, him. yeah, it's, it's not about K. It, these are all great players internationally as well, but as a team, it, you almost bring it back down to the St. Louis side. If you have players like that and you can play as a team, I don't know. I, I don't know. Uh, I I'm think just, that's. I'm a, gonna I, wait till week eight. Okay. <laughs> no, and it's fair. And and again, going back to just like he's a, kind of an injury prone or had been a little bit more of an injury prone player in his last years at Napoli, and he's come here and he immediately got hurt when he got here, and then this season he played 30 minutes before getting hurt again. So I think that yeah. these are all fair discussion points and thought processes. Okay, would we be better off if this was we got to sign a different DP? But again, yeah. obviously they're they're better if if he's no, fit while, yeah, he's yeah. On, while he's under under contract. Well, uh, Red Bulls might have been thinking that about Ukinia at the time over the past 20 <laughs> games and I don't know 10 9 whatever 8 months it had been since June 2022 since Lukinia scored he scored Dante Vanzier scored they win at home against Are Columbus Tom is that I don't know celebration is that these it's ball I, I, I guess <laughs> I think connected to Vanzier Vanzier I was like if he went good catch guys yeah, V's to the ear. No, what that's, that's I was too busy there. looking at. He, he's a proud member of Team Tuck, Kalen Carr. Like yeah. you guys need to bring that up on Wednesday. Like I, I, I was. I hope that he saw it and has been celebrating, adding him to the squad with with Ray Gaddis. So yeah, that, uh, again, Van Zier. MPR. <laughs> last year, a lot of my kind of talking points around Red Bulls were they have a really strong structure. They have a lot of good players. Their floor is pretty high, but they need somebody to be a best eleven caliber player that can take them to the next level. And I was saying, Lukinas. Had to be that guy because that that's kind of what they brought him in for. He looked really good at first. And then yeah, uh, Saturday was his first goal in like 22 appearances or, or whatever it was. He had one assist and zero goals in his in his last 20 games part of this. So good fortune that was there. So Van Zier is that guy now. So it's going to be a lot of the same talking points where they need him to be special. And his pedigree is really strong. He was, you know, a goal. Like it was like two goals every three games essentially in Belgium. Like he's a legitimately can be a really great player in this league. So that's what they need from him to take the next step. Again, I'm not worried about their floor. They have a lot of very good players. They have a really strong structure. All of that, if Van Zier is special, this team can be special. What I loved about just his cameo, and obviously not mm-hmm. that many minutes, um, after the goal, he sets up Omir Fernandez for that chance where he hits the post. Mm-hmm. 
So he's mm -hmm. showing that he can be flexible, that he can come in a little deeper and create. He creates that out of a dribble, but he picks his head up. And he had a shooting lane. Instead, he tries to curl it to that far post, and it's a gorgeous pass. And that's where you start to see, can he play with Burke? Can he play with mm -hmm. Manuel? Can he play with Lewis Morgan up top? Can he drop in deeper and, and feed Luquinhos? This team has a lot of half pieces. And as Tom said, they need elite talent, but they also need the straw to stir the whole thing. I just did 17 different things uh, all in one uh, analysis. But if, we love if, it. He, if he can be that piece, like there's a lot of Nicholas Joachini, Jared Stroud level players in this team, you know, and what we've seen Joaquin Torres be like, there are those pieces. You just need the main central force that they can all play around. Uh, crew side, a little bit of growing pains. It feels like no Kucha Hernandez in this game. He's dealing with a little bit of knock and, I don't really think that this loss is about not having Cucho, though that's always going to be a significant issue. It more seems to me like they're still not quite there with the way that Nancy wants to play. Um, and the possession, especially against the Red Bulls press in their own half of the field, was not nearly clean enough um, to get the ball forward and create chances from possession. Mm -hmm. Like, you, if you can't get it out of your own half cleanly, you're not going to get it into the final third to create the kind of chances that Nancy likes to create. And he's he's playing a lot of young players, which credit to Wilfred. That's his MO. That's what he wants to do. That's what the crew have sort of, like, decided they want to do as well. You don't hire him otherwise. But you're going to have blips like this, I think, if you do that. And I don't yeah, mind that they tried – sorry. I don't, I don't mind no, that they tried um, – that they didn't try changing how they play because there's not a lot of teams in Major League Soccer like New York Red Bulls where you know what you're getting week in and week out with them that are going to press you until you can't breathe. So I, I kind of appreciate this from a manager and it, and it teaches these guys, look, you're going to have to play in difficult moments in different parts of different games because let's just say you go against uh, Minnesota where they'll press you for five minutes and then drop back in. So it's, it's not like this Red Bull, but it's going to teach them to be able to deal with this situation down the road. When teams are pressing you, look, we played against New York Red Bulls. It didn't work out, but we now have those like images in our head of how to play out of a high press in certain instances of a game. So I don't mind this from the manager um, in this game. Anyways, yeah, it, it was admirable that, that again, against the pressiest of pressing teams on the road that they still try to play like this. Um, but I did think that it was ironic that the one time, one of the few times that they went route one, it was how they scored on their only shot, the only time that they really had a chance. And again, it was a defensive mistake by the Red Bulls, but the one time they went route one is when they scored. Alexandru Matan siding on that one. He gets the goal here. Zellerion sort of in a false Two nine. Two goals this year? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it's happening. It's working. It's, it's one, of the, one of the most pleasant stories in the league this year is what Alexandru Matan has been. Like, he was not just... A ca like he was a castaway under Caleb Porter. Like they sent him on loan back to a Romanian club who were going to keep him. And then like the club were like, yeah, sure. Like he hasn't shown anything. And again, Caleb Porter just Please. didn't, didn't play him. But like, but there, there was a reason why he went on loan and they were with a very nominal, per like they were ready to let him go. And Nancy said, no, like, let me work with him in preseason and then we'll, we'll make the decision. And the Nancy liked what he saw and kept him. And now he's starting and playing really well. It's again, I think that that's what, what you were saying. Well, that's why you hire Wilfred Nancy for his young players. Like that's, a tangible effect of a player who they were going to let go for essentially nothing and roll the dice on another signing has been a starting level player for them. All right, let's fire through some of these so we don't take up your entire beginning of your week here. Sanders LFC had a huge potential to be maybe the match of the weekend. Uh, it was a, a hard fought, good match. It just didn't have any goals in it. So no fireworks on that one. Scoreless draw. Raul Diaz starts. He plays a little bit more than an hour. Doesn't really look like himself just yet. Aaron Long looks a little bit closer to himself, if not all the way there. Aaron Long also sparked a nice little brouhaha that got people talking about a potential on-field rivalry brewing between these two teams. Had a couple kicks at Steph Fry's hands and then uh, went off for a, a good minute or two there. A lot of pushing and shoving and yelling and pointing. And you like to see <laughs> that against uh, two of the, the biggest teams in the Western Conference. Dave, here's some question for you on, on LAFC, who probably should have won this game at the end. Like Mahalo Poku... Sky had a clear chance on the doorstep, mm -hmm. and they had some other chances. Um, Kevin Morrison said LFC almost won on tired legs. A draw on the road in Seattle on worn tires should be frightening for the rest of the league. And Serge C wants to know if LA uh, could do something different with their rotations, or has Steve Cherundolo done the best possible job he can in this busy early stretch? I think he's done as well as we've seen clubs do. There's no track record for teams competing at a high level in CCL and winning in MLS. Like, literally doesn't exist. Most of the teams that have made a CCL final run 
have not even made the playoffs. So I think you've seen there's clear ideas, right? There's three center backs. They have rotated almost exactly to the clean minute. There are four center mids. They have rotated them almost exactly. We've seen Buke get a bunch of minutes. Apoku out. Vela really off the bench. So it seems like at, you know they have a clear idea of the minutes loads. And then there's players like Dennis Buongo who they think can handle a little bit more. And they've given them that role. They've rotated and, and had to now with Hollingshead. Um, goalkeeper is a bit of an issue. Right, John McCarthy gives up a chance against Alajolense that shouldn't have existed because their starting goalkeeper is injured and out. But I think LAFC has done as well with this as we've ever seen an MLS team do. Um, and the focus should be CCL for them. This is a team that wants to contend at a higher level. They want to do new things in Major League Soccer. Going and winning a, a continental competition would be something like that. Vancouver up next for LAFC in CCL. And then the other side of that particular side of the bracket is Philly Atlas. So maybe a final in the future for them. TBD, the Galaxy, no CCL final in the future for them. Greg Vanny said before the season started, we belong in CCL. We should be there, a club like us. He also targeted the Supporters' Shield as a potential thing for them to win and said, I don't see why we can't do it. Um, they draw again. This one, a 1-1 draw at home against the Vancouver Whitecaps. There was a pretty noticeable protest outside the stadium from fans who remain unhappy about the way things are going, especially with the front office. And, you know, we know the facts there. They can't make transfers outside the league this summer. They haven't won anything of note in basically a decade. And, um, you know, it's a club and a fan base that hadn't been accustomed to winning things, right? Like when players take the field in L.A., both the home team and the opposing team have to walk by five MLS Cups. That's intentional. That's to remind people of the history and the success that the club has had, and they haven't really tasted it yet. And it looked like they were going to start having it this year. Uh, they were much better, uh, Tom, against the Galaxy. Created a lot more chances. They did have two goals called back. Greg Vanny's still upset about the Dejan Jovlich goal, and so is Dejan, who was pointing at his, <laughs> his chest and his shoulder joint here, which technically would not be a handball, and saying, I didn't handle this thing. It's not – shouldn't have called that. Uh, I would agree with him. I don't think it was a handball if it wasn't called, and maybe if it was reviewed. I don't think there were the angles to overturn it, but I don't think it hit him in the arm. Uh, they would have won 2-1, but they didn't. Uh, but we're going to focus off the field. Uh, you have a report here that Will Koontz has joined the LA Galaxy front office. He, of course, was uh, in that LAFC front office from the jump and built helped build those rosters with John Thorrington and others that led to an MLS Cup and a couple shields. So tell us about this. This is a big change and this is big news in Galaxy Land. Yeah, this is this is really big news kind of in the front office off the field stuff. Uh, Will Koontz was regarded as one of the league's best, you know, number twos at LAFC. I figured that his next job would have just been becoming a GM somewhere else and stepping into the number one seat. Uh, he left LAFC this winter um, and it's kind of been in the works for a while or not, not since before that, but it's been in the works for a few weeks that he would be joining the LA Galaxy. I don't know what his exact role is. We're going to have to wait for the kind of press release when they do uh, announce it and make it official. But he's really good with with numbers. And particularly, like, he was described to me as like a cap wizard. He worked in the league office before he was at LAFC. He's, he's some, something that the Galaxy said that they've, like, a, a skill that they wanted to have. Somebody who could maximize the salary cap, which is going to be very important with these sanctions. And, that you know, they can't sign players from abroad in the summer. They also have some allocation money taken away from them as part of those sanctions. So, again, this is this is a big move. He's somebody that I, again, expected to take over as a number one somewhere. I'm not I don't think that that's the case here at the Gal Galaxy. So I think it's a really smart, really good addition by them. It's actually kind of baffling that he hasn't, by the yeah. way. This is one of those things that hasn't made sense for a while in MLS. I know he was a finalist, I believe, in San Jose and maybe Houston as well, uh, if I'm correct. But I know he's been out there and interviewed because LAFC are one of the gold standards of this league. Yeah. And so he worked in the league office. Then he went out there and helped things. Um, what's interesting about the Galaxy is I think his background's actually with the New York Yankees before he came into soccer. That, yeah, and so, that's where he started. Yep. So you've got a, a heritage sports franchise that had to find its feet again. Uh, sounds like the LA Galaxy. Uh, they go sign another U22 outside back, Tom? Is that the case? Yep. Yep. They finalized the deal to sign Julian Aude from Club Lanus. He's 19, I believe, so he turns 20 soon. Um, he's He started three games for the Argentine. Time U20 team at, at the South American Championships. It did not go well for Argentina, but he's a very highly rated player. Uh, it's very exciting signing. A lot of teams are using the U22 initiative as a way to build depth and, and add, you know, talented players. Like, 
he's going to hit the cap at like 150,000. That, that's really valuable. Again, particularly when you have these sanctions, um, you know, Raheem Edwards has, has played really, really well. So there is no kind of expectation or need for Arde to step in and be a 90 minute player every single game. So we'll see what they get there. There are other U22 initial players like Dejan Jovlic and Lucas Caligari, who was available for selection for the first time this weekend. He did not make his debut yet, but again, the idea is he'll be a starting right back for the team. And now you use the U22 initiative to bring in Arde. Uh, Efra Alvarez was on the U22 initiative. They were able, they moved him off because uh, the, that's how you kind of maximize the salary cap. So he's no longer U22 initiative player. It's also set, set piece defending. When if you have any collapses there, you, you get moved off U22s. In, that, fear, that I wrote about this in, in the wrap up calling. It's just straight up inexcusable. Like if you go go back and watch that goal, um, he, he the didn't Tristan move. Blackman Tristan, goal for the Vancouver Whitecaps. He didn't move. Play. Like that, that directly costs them points. Like it's 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 absolutely inexcusable. I know that again. He's he's an attacking player. He's not you know thought of as somebody who should be having big responsibilities on set pieces. But you know he's been he's been a professional for like six years. I think now. Like that. He's also an attacking player who doesn't create goal scoring chances and doesn't finish <laughs> goal scoring chances. So it's not it's not the best time to not defend as well. But the Oscar <laughs> does go to Ryan Gold, who bent over and pretended to touch the ball with his hands to at the start of the free kick. And hence, no one on the LA Galaxy could defend in any way. I'm surprised, by the way, that you think um, Kelvin Leardam's going to get replaced because he's a lean goal scorer on this team. So that's <laughs> your starting right back right there. Uh, let's go to Minnesota, who win again, set pieces. Uh, this is your team, Weeby. This is your LA Galaxy. This is the LA Galaxy you created. <laughs> uh, uh, nervous laughter. Uh, no Reynoso still for Minnesota United. They do make a U-22 winger signing from uh, Wolverhampton, a South Korean youth international, which maybe we'll get a nugget on here in a second. But let's uh, throw it to you, Kaylin, on Minnesota United. That's their first win ever in Colorado. Had a nice set piece goal for the winner. Mm-hmm. Nick says we should have a set piece goal of the week for Minnesota United. Is it a thing? Can it be a thing? We've already established via Dave that the set piece of the week goes to Vancouver, but Minnesota are going to lean on set pieces. You would think without right now. So, uh, and then uh, Bongi Hulongwe. Oh man, I had that st- Hwane. I had it down before the show, and I just rushed through it. <laughs> right, yeah, you rushed uh, through it. Yeah. That's some dangerous moments as well that Nick wants us to talk about. What'd you see from the loons? Look, uh, obviously, everyone. <sighs> Let's just throw it out there, okay? I'm Minnesota United blood through and through until Adrian is no longer at that team. But <laughs> what I will through, say, through, through, through I, until. I will, good, through good times and bad, it is like a marriage. We're not so. getting divorced, so I am all aboard the Minnesota train. Now, whether you like how they play or not, what I will say is Adrian Heath is very well organized, and especially this season, because I think – Last season, for me, the center back pairing wasn't good enough. They leaked way too many goals, and it was always self-induced. And it was when they were leading games or playing really well, and then they would just switch off. I think this year, defensively, it's probably the best they've ever looked. They look more organized, and I don't know if that is because they don't have Emmanuel Reynoso that is kind of given a free role. The team was always around Reynoso. Everything was built through Reynoso. So he didn't love defending. I mean, what attacker does? Robin Lode has slotted into that number 10 position. I think he's done a really good job. I mean, he's very underrated within Major League Soccer. He's one of my most favorite players, not even because he plays for Minnesota United. So I, I think they they do have a couple more pieces I that I know that they are looking for without, you know, getting a divorce from my husband was saying it on this show or without getting fired from major league soccer. So there's a lot of moving pieces. So I'm going to leave that to Tom for all the breaking. A L- lot, lot of talk about marriages and divorces and lack thereof. So I, I think, I think if your family is listening to this, this is a, this is a very good segment that everything's yeah. rock solid. We're good. Yeah. This is a relationship advice column as well. If you didn't know that <laughs> soccer and relationship advice. Um, but yeah, I, I think this Minnesota side is, is let's just be honest. One of the, I think, four teams that have made the playoffs in the last five years. Very difficult to do in Major League Soccer. They just haven't been able to go farther in the playoffs. They are, for me, still missing, you know, a goal-scoring threat. I think, you know, you look at Garcia, he's done okay since coming in, getting his goal um, last game to build that confidence. He's got to continue to push forward with that. But, hey, Minnesota MLS Cup champs. Here we go, baby. <laughs> Putting on their hard hats. <laughs> Finding a way. I, I will say Miguel Tapias is uh, one of the signings that sort of went under the radar mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. this offseason. That was a really good move uh, for them as well. And, and he's helped with Boxel. He's helped with Boxel because I think Boxel, for me, was one of those players that switched off in, in big moments and gave up some goals defensively just with his positioning. And he's looked like old Michael Boxel when he first came in uh, to Minnesota. Sorry for cutting you off. Ed. No, no. Tapias got the winner. And uh, Tapias got the winner. And then, look, it's Ariaga 
and Rosales in front of them. So I, it feels to me like Adrian's basically saying, look, Garcia, Bongi, Lode, you know, whoever's on that other wing, whether it's Dotson or this new winger or whoever well, else. It wasn't in this game, by the way. It was Rosales on the Rosales. left wing. Really? Yeah. Dotson. Oh, Dotson? Yeah. And it was interesting because then they brought Fragapane on, and instead yeah. of dropping Rosales, they actually dropped Ludd deeper alongside Ariaga and put Fragapane in as the 10, where I actually thought he looked pretty good. He mm-hmm. creates a chance for Kamar Lawrence down the left side and obviously has the free kick. And I, I, I feel the excitement here from Kalen. I love it. I'm curious what it continues to look like. For like, sure. As and, and, come out of these yeah. games, is Fragapane your 10? Is Rosales a winger? Like, I'm just very curious to see how Minnesota know grows as this goes along. <laughs> And I, and I think one thing, too, even in this match, obviously away from home in Colorado, never won against them. It was their first win. Adrian also rested a couple of his players that had been starting, like a will trap, because they're missing seven players this coming weekend. So, um, yeah, anyways, I'm just positive. Positive, positive, positive today on this Monday. <laughs> the Minnesota – people are going to hate me. Okay, I'm done. I'm done being a Minnesota supporter until Saturday. Okay. That's a good break. Box solid. Enough. That's enough time. All right, some matches of note. We'll run through them quick. We talked about the fire in FC Cincinnati. Uh, No Lucho here, so Marco Angulo got his first start for FC Cincinnati. Uh, On the other side, no number 10 for the fire. Uh, Shakiri missed the match. Right leg injury of some sort. Casper Shabilko scored a banger, so that's good for all of you who still hold the Shabilko stock. Until he misses, Rafael Shios is your penalty kick taker. Respect defenders taking penalties. I don't like attacking players doing unnecessary stuff. Do not just give it to Shakiri just because he's in the game. Shiho scored. He's on the on the spot till he stops scoring. He scored, but that's what you can. Like, he just sort it of sounds... weakly hit it down the middle. Yeah. Celentano probably. Wow. Yeah. Don't like, they always say if you hit it down the middle, so you it score like through, 71% I think it went of the time? Sa- Sasha would there. disagree with you. I'm just going to yeah, throw it out well. there. That was his bread and butter. Yeah. Uh, FC Dallas 2, Sporting Kansas City 1. Corey Engelmeyer hit us up and said, we know a player making a leap in his second year falls in the Goss theorem. Is there a term for a player who comes in midseason, wins the adoration of pundits, then just can't score in his second year? Maybe the Doyle foil asking for a friend named (laughs) Willie. (laughs) The Doyle foil is good. Yeah, that, that has that's good. <laughs> So that friend is that friend who's asking, not really, but uh, his straw man, but a real man, is Willie Agata. And Peter Vermees said after this game, and it was a good win for FC Dallas, an even better moment for Martin Paz with the double penalty save. Incredible. One on Agata, one on Tommy. Peter Vermees was asked about Agata's lack of goal, and Vermees was like, basically, and this is my translation, it's not his words, I don't know what to tell you, we're creating chances. He's got to finish <laughs> the chances. They're in position. They're creating a ton of chances. They may not all be super high percentage chances. But, uh, yeah, so far, the, the players are not finishing those chances. And the first goal they scored in the season was a deflection from Daniel Shalloway. So, and TP. Then, sorry, back to penalties here. Eric, Tommy misses twice. I, I got him. Missed. missed. Pa oh. saved it. It got VAR'd. Oh, yeah. And they did no, it no, no. again. No, no, Agata, Agata took the first, the first one. one. Yeah. Oh, Tommy only took to the Tommy. second yeah. one? Yeah. 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 Oh, Which is I even worse because the first one is actually a reasonable attempt by Agata, yeah. just a good save by Paz, and he was maybe like two inches off the line. They caught it on video mm-hmm. review. The Tommy PK was terrible. Yeah. It's a bad horrible hit. PK. Pa- you know who so, would have pa- scored that? Fontas. Okay. Real quick on Paz, by the way. Put Robert Volader in there. <laughs> he had those two that PK saves, one only one that, that that was official because of the retake, and then he got uh, called for re- a, a third PK and a red card that was at, overturned by VAR. So this was all kind of, I believe, all of that happened in the second half, and he was, was asked about it the after same the game. Ten minutes. Yeah, he was asked about it after the game, and he was just like, "Yeah, welcome to MLS." <laughs> the most amazing part he about gets it. it was he gets the second yellow, he walks off the field, <laughs> and Nico Estevez is standing there, and he's like, "Don't go anywhere." Because he might be coming back in, and security can't figure out if they should escort, escort him off or not. And the fourth official's there, and everyone's just kind of patiently waiting. They were, like, pretty good about not getting in the ref's face. And then it turned out that it was an offside call before the yes. penalty that he <clears throat> would have which conceded. Was, it was a very clear offside. We didn't even include it in instant replay, which was quite busy this week, as you can imagine. But Jesus for scored. And so did Alan Velasco. Yeah. Who's happy about having a fast start? Dallas, here we go. We'll Jesus talk more to about Jesus them. To Jesus. Yeah, we'll talk about more and more about them in a later show here when we're talking supporter shield possibilities because Dave's Dave believes and I like that. All right, uh, two more games. We'll run through them quick. NYCFC three, DC United two. 
uh, Birnbaum almost ties this for DC after just uh, Mac trucking poor Keaton <laughs> Parks uh, in the second half. DC turned things on its head in the second half because they made a bunch of subs, put a bunch of young players on, and just kind of made it into a street fight. Uh, it's a good plan at Yankee Stadium, generally. But Santi Rodriguez is the difference, I think, Dave. And this young core for NYCFC, I'll give you like 45 seconds to a minute to wax poetic because we're talking Keaton, Sands, Magno gets a goal, Santi, uh, Andrade gets a goal as well. Like We talked about cores a while back. This is a special one. It's special, and maybe it won't be one player becoming Tiago Amada, but when all of them are on the field, they all do so many things well that that's where you start to open up opportunities, right? You've got Kufre coming down the left side. That lets Pellegrini come inside. Magno can float. Santi Rodriguez can take spaces. Gabby Pereira as well. There is so much versatility in this team. The conversation for a while has been as tall as Magno and nine. It probably doesn't maximize him up there, but it might maximize the team with all of these pieces available. And if Richie Ledesma is the next guy, I think he fits that role as well. And so NYCFC, as we expected since week one, They've improved their roster so heavily that they've reinserted themselves back in the conversation of being one of the better teams in the Eastern Conference. This was their best performance so far. Um, the defense looks solid once again, and then everything going forward is exciting. And, you know, it felt like a good atmosphere in the building, and I think it's a team you want to come and watch. Uh, New England, also one of those teams at the top of the East. They have three shutouts in four games. They win one nothing against Nashville, who made some changes tactically to try to deal with some injury issues that they had. Gary Smith said, hey, those didn't work out for us, but Gustavo Bo got his first goal of the season, so congratulations to him. And we're going to have to cut the mailbag short on this show, and I will point you in one direction to assign blame. That is producer Anders. So if you'd like to tweet at Sports Viking on Twitter and uh, bring your grievances to him, do so. I've read many tweets in this show already, so I don't feel any guilt at all. Can I do one short mailbag one? Sure. Uh, what was with your choice of not wearing socks on set? Uh, I thought, you know what, it's not, technically, <laughs> it's not technically spring yet. I'll just say that this wasn't, you know, if we have to go to video review on this one, I would, I would say we, we need a better, we need a standing angle as opposed to a yep. sitting angle. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. A very. I like the look. I, li- I just saw on Twitter tried. that a lot of people you feel were like you, did, on you. Did you say that because you feel like you had to say that and be a good teammate? You can be honest, Kim. Yeah. yeah no, because, no, no, no. You know what? Yeah, that's a lot that. of pasty white leg. Yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to bring you. I'm a lot of Midwest. I'm going to bring you a bottle of my spray tan here that I yeah, brought from Miami. Just fair. spray tan your yeah, ankles for yeah, the yeah. next show. Just, the re- just my face and my hands, just very, very like winter Midwestern. And then it my, like my legs. It looked like cheese in here. <laughs> it, was, it, was very, it was very Provel of me. You're it right about Pro-Val. that. Yeah, very Provel <laughs> of me. Ah, uh, that was a good ending to the show. Enjoy your week, everyone. We have uh, gone off the rails in the best way possible Happy today. Open Cup, everyone. Get tested for strep. <laughs> With that, adios. See you on Thursday.